Hi, and welcome to the program, Naloxone for Opioid-Induced Respiratory Depression. My name is Dr. Anita Jacobson. I am a clinical professor at the University of Rhode Island in the College of Pharmacy. I am also a practicing pharmacist and the program director of the Community First Responder Program, which provides harm reduction resources and naloxone across the state of Rhode Island. So our learning objectives for today are to be able to identify risk factors for opioid-induced respiratory depression, explain the cycle of opioid use disorder and mechanism of the opioid antagonist naloxone, commonly referred to as Narcan, describe the process of responding to an overdose, including supportive care, and get into a little bit about myths and stigma related to responding to an opioid-induced breathing emergency. So start out with looking at some data on opioid use and overdose nationwide. So certainly we are all well aware that we are in the middle of an ever-growing opioid overdose epidemic. We lose over 130 Americans every day um, related to an opioid-involved drug overdose. And drug overdose is now the leading cause of death among Americans under the age of 50. We also have seen an increase in pediatric poisonings, um, as well as teenagers and young adults, which may be due to accidental and or recreational exposure. So if we look at this graph that shows the uh, changing dynamic in the opioid overdose epidemic, we see looking back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, there was an increase in prescription involved opioid overdose deaths. I vividly remember this time. Uh, I was doing my residencies uh, at the big uh, hospitals that are located in our state of Rhode Island. And I remember the drug representatives coming on to the units in the um, trauma and surgical ICUs, as well as the medical floors, and promoting the drug OxyContin, uh, which is a long-acting medication for pain, uh, and really touting that it had low or no addiction potential due to that long duration of action so that there were not the associated peaks and troughs that we see with shorter-acting opioids. And that coupled with pressure from the Joint Commission to achieve zero pain scores for patients, it was considered inhumane for people to experience pain surrounding uh, a procedure or surgery or uh, injury. So those two things coupled together really led to an increase in prescribing and then a slow but steady increase in prescription involved opioid overdose deaths. Around 2010, we begin to see a more precipitous rise in heroin-involved overdose deaths. This is predominantly due to a crossover. Um, it's very rare for me to have a patient who reports that the first opioid they were ever exposed to was heroin, uh, but this may be due to a switchover for recreational use or someone who started out with a, legitim a legitimate medical purpose and then transitions over to heroin. And then in 2014 and 15 and 16, we see a huge rise in synthetic involved opioid overdose deaths. And this is due and being driven by illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So this slide shows equally potent amounts of heroin, fentanyl, and then an, an analog of fentanyl, car fentanyl, which sometimes have been, has been popularly referred to as an elephant tranquilizer. And you can see that it's a much, much smaller amount of fentanyl equivalent to um, a much larger amount of heroin and then a single granule of the powerful analog car fentanyl. You can also see that these substances are white, they're granular, they, they really look the same. So someone who is using unregulated substances like cocaine, like heroin, like counterfeit tablets, uh, would really not have any idea that fentanyl or one of its potent analogs is in that unregulated product. So I'd like to uh, get into a little bit about the concepts of tolerance and dependence and how they interplay with um, opioid overdose risk. 
So just as a review, I actually find it very helpful when I meet with um, particularly caregivers and families of someone who's struggling with substance use disorder, just to give them um, a little review. I actually will pull this slide up on my computer screen uh, because people have often heard the term opioid, but really actually don't know which medications are and are not opioids and which substances are and are not opioids. And there's a lot of um, misinformation that you know is circulating in the world. So I think it's very helpful to go through and kind of teach um, caregivers and, and family members and friends about these different opioids, their different potencies. Um, so our strong opioid agonists, morphine, fentanyl, methadone, heroin, hydromorphone or dilaudid, oxycodone and mepiridine. Um, I do stress with people that methadone is unique in that it has a long duration of action and a ceiling effect so we can get people stable on a dose for months, years, even sometimes decades is needed. Uh, and they can it can help them with their cravings, get their life back in order if they were previously addicted to a substance like illicitly manufactured fentanyl or heroin. Um, and it's a very useful treatment tool for opioid use disorder. The more moderate opioid agonist, codeine, which they might be familiar with in cough and cold preparations, and hydrocodone. Some more unusual opioid agonist, tramadol, which has some serotonergic activity as well, and then dextromethorphan, which until recently was available over the counter without even age restrictions. Uh, but now, you know, we do have um, some age restrictions in place. Uh, but I do remember practicing in community pharmacy and finding bottles uh, littering the parking lot at the end of my shift of uh, consumed uh, Robitussin DM or NyQuil that had dextromethorphan because people are trying to get a hallucinogenic effect. And then the partial opioid agonist buprenorphine, um, commonly called Suboxone, which is also a useful tool for opioid use disorder. And then the opioid blockers. So we're going to be talking a lot about naloxone or Narcan, but then naltrexone is available as a long-acting injection also to treat opioid use disorder. It can be a little more tricky to get people onboarded due to the fact that they have to be off of opioids for two weeks prior to starting naltrexone. So that can be a harder onboarding. So I do also spend time talking to family members and caregivers and friends about how opioids work in the central nervous system, not really getting into the mu, kappa, and delta receptor detail, but just talking about how for specific individuals who ha have a propensity um, for addiction, about 20 to 25% of the population, with exposure to opioids, they will experience a profound euphoria. So all of us may experience the pain relief aspects of opioids, but not everyone experiences the same amount of euphoria and pleasure. Um, and for a percent of the population, they will go on to misuse opioids, even if they are exposed for a legitimate medical reason. And it winds up being about 10 to 12 percent of the population who will go on to misuse opioids uh, and continue for a year later after even a short-term exposure. We don't fully understand all the environmental and genetic factors that play into that, uh, but it helps people to, to um, get out of the cycle of blaming someone for addiction when you really talk about how this happens in the central nervous system. Um, it's also important to explain tolerance. So as people use opioids for any reason, either recreationally or for a medical reason, uh, over time that repeated exposure will cause a desensitization of the receptors and it will take more and more opioid to create the same effect, whether that's pain relief or whether it is euphoria. What happens with time is that when people are taking opioids and have a high tolerance, they may be consuming very large amounts, an amount that would be fatal to someone who is opioid naive, similar to alcohol. We see that with, and I usually use that analogy with uh, people to help them understand that someone who's never had an alcoholic drink before might get uh, tipsy or drunk with a very small amount compared to someone who consumes alcohol regularly. And that can sometimes help people understand that concept. 
So what happens is when people stop using an opioid, if they were using it for a long period of time, the receptors do return to baseline relatively quickly. So if they are perhaps incarcerated or in rehab um, and then are discharged into the community and start using a substance again, if they take the same amount that they could previously tolerate, it now might be enough to cause an opioid overdose and breathing emergency. Physical dependence also happens with everyone who is exposed to opioids and is different than psychological dependence. So the body becomes dependent on the opioid and people may experience withdrawal symptoms to varying degrees depending on how much and how long they were using opioids. Uh, and those withdrawal symptoms are very unpleasant for people. I have had patients describe it to me as the worst uh, like the worst stomach bug they've ever had in their life, the worst influenza they've ever had in their life, with a whole bunch of anxiety sprinkled over the top of that. Um, and it's something that they um, are quite desperate to avoid going through again. It's a very unpleasant process. So how do people move from the use of prescription opioids to heroin? It's usually due to cost and access issues. So maybe easier to get heroin on the street unregulated um, and the cost is often lower. The percent of people at risk for developing an opioid use disorder is about 20, 20, 20 to 25% of the population have a vulnerability, but we do find that about half of those will kind of self-select out maybe due to positive environmental factors, family support, education, other you know, environmental factors, and uh, don't, don't go on to pursue that, and about 10 to 12% will. And the driving factor for continued opioid misuse uh, is really described in this cycle here, that, that desire for that feeling of euphoria, loss of control, using larger and larger amounts due to tolerance, spending your time, your effort, your money uh, to get that next dose. And really withdrawal is the major driving factor, that fear of withdrawal and that desperation to avoid going into withdrawal for people who um, have become dependent. So we consider opioid use disorder and I advocate for patients and their families to consider it a chronic condition, the same way we think of asthma or diabetes or high blood pressure, um, and that we want to have evidence-based treatment that includes uh, certainly behavioral aspects and components and environmental supports, as well as pharmaceutical treatment, which might be methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. So looking specifically at overdose risk factors and naloxone, so I like to talk about overdose with people who are using prescription medications as a breathing emergency. I find my patients who are taking pain medications um, are resistant to talking about their risk of overdose and are more receptive when I refer to it as a breathing emergency. And that's accurate because when you have too much opioid in the bloodstream, uh, the overdose is characterized by respiratory depression, which leads to a lack of oxygen and ultimately death if no intervention is made. So looking at our patients who have the highest risk of experiencing overdose, um, here are some of the risk factors, but we certainly advocate for anyone who is taking uh, certainly unregulated opioids. They should have Narcan, Naloxone, um, at home and know how to use it and know how to give it to someone else and have someone else who can administer it to them. And really anyone taking a prescription opioid for any reason should have naloxone available as well, never knowing who might get into um, their medications or what other factors might happen. But these are some of the highest risk categories. So people who've gone back to use after losing their tolerance, as we talked about before, if they've had a previous non-fatal overdose, if they're using high doses or long-acting formulations, using any unregulated substances alone is a high risk. Mixing of opioids with anything else that is sedating, so sedating antidepressants, alcohol, certainly benzodiazepines, a red flag should be going uh, off with that. Uh, but anything sedating, gabapentin, Benadryl, you know, the list goes on. 
compromised health conditions, particularly lung related, so pneumonia, influenza, COVID, acute illnesses, sleep apnea, COPD, asthma, emphysema, and then liver or kidney conditions due to a lack of metabolism and excretion, uh, so there can be a buildup of opioid in the bloodstream. So naloxone is used to reverse an opioid overdose. It is a prescription medication. Um, it is non-addictive. It only works on opioids. So if there's multiple substances in someone's system, uh, it's only acting on the opioid component and it can help to restore their breathing. Lay people can give it as a nasal spray or for some can do an intramuscular injection. I have some where they're very uncomfortable with that and some uh, people who are, who are quite confident with it. The effect has an onset of two to three minutes and a duration of 30 to 90 minutes, very safe. And we are seeing that sometimes there are multiple doses of naloxone required. This may be due to the potency of illicitly manufactured fentanyl, but it also might be due to um, people's lack of objectivity when they are administering naloxone. They have someone in front of them who is not breathing, who is turning blue. Uh, they may rapidly administer doses of naloxone in succession. So it's difficult to tease out why people are, are using more and more naloxone. So naloxone literally works by antagonizing and pushing the opioids off the receptors and preferentially binding. It doesn't remove the opioid from the system. Uh, so the person may go back into an overdose situation uh, after 30 to 90 minutes when the naloxone wears off. It also may precipitate withdrawal, and the severity of that really varies from person to person and also in the amount of naloxone administered. So administering multiple doses of naloxone is going to potentially worsen withdrawal um, and that really unpleasant experience for people. So we do have, of course, an expiration date on naloxone, and we want to be mindful of that and get a new one when it's getting close to the time. Um, however, it does not become toxic. So if all you have is an expired product, any naloxone is better than no naloxone. It should be stored at room temperature. There are some excursions permitted, so people living in climates that are hotter or um, colder, you know, something to consider. If you have to keep it in a car, which is not ideal, uh, perhaps keep it in a soft or hard-sided cooler to, to protect it from extremes of temperature. So for overdose assessment and response, um, this is a quote from the former Surgeon General Jerome Adams. If we want to make a dent in this overdose epidemic, we need everyone to consider themselves a first responder. We need to look at it the same way we look at CPR, and we need everyone carrying naloxone. And this is really um, how we named our program, the Community First Responder Program, and this is the philosophy that we've carried forward with community distribution. So to evaluate for an there are a few steps I'm going to go through on the next slide, but once you've determined uh, that someone's unconscious, certainly calling 911 needs to be that first step. Administer naloxone if you have it available. If you have two people, you can have one person call 911 and one person give the naloxone. You give another dose after two to three minutes if the person is not responsive to that first dose. You can support their ventilation um, and you know, stay with that person throughout the experience. So overdoses can happen within minutes. They can happen to someone who's opioid naive, so their first ever experience, or it can happen when they've been taking opioids for many years or even decades. The person, the key thing is that they will be unresponsive. So if someone is intoxicated on opioids, maybe slurring their words, they have pinpoint pupils, they're groggy, you know, you certainly want to watch them and stay with them, but that would not be the time to administer naloxone. This is for someone who is unresponsive, even to taking the knuckles of your hand and rubbing it firmly on their breastbone. Um, then, you know, you know they are unconscious because that's quite uncomfortable. They may have slow or no breathing, or it may sound like they're snoring. They may become pale, and they may start to have signs of hypoxia with their fingernails or lips turning blue. 
So how to give naloxone nasal spray, uh, which I find is the easiest for lay people. I've done some education on the naloxone intramuscular for lay people, and it's often harder unless they have some experience with um, doing injections. But with the nasal spray, it's really quite easy. So people remove the device from the package only when they're ready to use it. Hold it with the thumb on the bottom of the plunger and the first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Tilt the person's head back supporting the neck and insert the nozzle into the nostril. Uh, then you depress the plunger firmly and each of these devices is a one-time use. You can also provide ventilatory support and or CPR, depending on whether or not the person has a pulse. Because opioid overdose is predominantly a breathing emergency, it is not uncommon for someone to have a pulse, so you would not want to do chest compressions if that's the case. But depending on how long it's been going on, they may uh, need compression CPR. And this is really dependent on your level of training and comfort, and I spend a lot of time with families and caregivers talking about this, particularly in the time of COVID, people may be hesitant uh, with a stranger or someone they don't know to provide rescue breathing. So it's important to assure them that just administering naloxone and calling 911 is beneficial. You've done something um, and it, it's often successful upwards of 75% of the time, just administering naloxone alone, staying with the person, calling 911, getting help um, is effective. If someone uh, needs to be left for any reason, perhaps the EMS can't locate you. Uh, the only time I've actually ever had to do CPR it was in the woods, and um, I did have to leave the person because the rescue couldn't find us on the trails. Uh, so you have to roll the person into the recovery position, which is not easy to do if it's someone who's much, much larger than you. Uh, but you want to do the best you can, and it's better with two people. Get them onto their side and put the knee out to stop them from rolling onto their stomach with the hand supporting the head. And this is to ensure if they were to start vomiting, it's going to help to reduce their risk of aspirating and choking. Some possible naloxone responses. The first is the ideal scenario. The person starts breathing and becomes responsive within that two to three minute window. Uh, the middle one, the person starts breathing and is groggy but not fully responsive. You would not give a second dose of naloxone in this instance. You would watch them very closely, stay with them. But in the third scenario where they don't respond and continue to be unconscious, then you would administer that second dose of naloxone. And again, you know, time sort of loses all perspective when you're in this very high stress environment. So when I'm educating people on this, I, I ask them to set a phone timer if they can, because the instinct is after 30 seconds, you're like, that has to be three minutes. And, um, you know, time really does lose perspective in those high stress scenarios. So some efforts to address the crisis that, uh, you know, going beyond naloxone. So our program is focused in harm reduction. So it's the public health effort to minimize the harm associated uh, with people who use unregulated substances. Um, so there are a lot of valuable resources out there, some that are listed on the bottom of your screen, the North American Needle Exchange Network at nasen.org. Treatment locator to find methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone providers at findtreatment.gov. Uh, and harm reduction resources by mail uh, at nextdistro.org. So these are some great resources nationwide. You can search by zip code or uh, state or town uh, and find resources near you. We do distribute uh, fentanyl test strips with our program. Um, it's important that people know that these are just a tool. Um, they are not 100% accurate. They are designed to help detect fentanyl and its analogs in unregulated substances like cocaine, heroin, or counterfeit pills. Um, and this is done by testing a residue, a small portion of finely uh, ground up powder that then cannot be used after it's been in contact with the fentanyl strip. Dilute with water, hold the wavy end of the test strip into the substance, um, and then after a couple of minutes, you'll see the test results. And it's important to educate people that one line is positive for fentanyl and two lines means fentanyl or its analogs wasn't detected, but 
still need to use caution. Always have naloxone, always have someone with you if you're using unregulated substances who can give the naloxone. You can always go slow. Use 10% of what you think you might need. You can always add more, but you can't take it away once it's been ingested. So people um, are often worried about their liability. So all 50 states do have civil and criminal immunity for good faith efforts of administering naloxone and trying to help someone who's having a medical emergency experiencing an overdose. Um, and this provides protection to people who seek that medical assistance by calling 911, performing rescue breathing or compressions and administering naloxone. In some states, there is more protection than others. So in some states, people cannot be charged uh, for drug or paraphernalia possession um, if they are helping someone in an overdose, and that may be used as a mitigating factor in criminal prosecution. Uh, it's important to know your individual state's Good Samaritan law because they're not federal, so they do differ widely. In all 50 states, uh, there is also um, standing orders available in pharmacies so that people can go into a pharmacy and request naloxone without a specific prescription. And the labeling requirements do vary by state. So some allow more anonymous um, and some you do have to have your name on the label. In some states, health insurers, including Medicaid, are actually required to cover the cost of naloxone, some even including a copay, and some might be without the copay. And again, that does vary a little bit by state. But in all 50 states, you can go into a pharmacy and get naloxone uh, on request dispensed to you, but there may be a cost associated with that. So to wrap up, I'd like to look at some uh, myths and stigma. Things that I commonly hear when I'm out at tabling events, uh, providing resources in the community. So the first one being is methadone or buprenorphine just trading one addiction for another. And this is something that I even hear um, sometimes in recovery spaces, AA um, and others might, some people might have um, strongly held views here. Um, and because methadone or buprenorphine have that effect of being, of being able to titrate someone to a stable dose for months, years, decades to control cravings. Uh, they don't need larger and larger amounts to create the same result. Um, we don't consider someone being addicted to methadone or buprenorphine when they are receiving that treatment. And it really um, is very valuable in helping people get their life back in order, handle different aspects, um, legal, financial, whatever you know, things they might have done damage to when they were actively using unregulated substances. And so we also find that the relapse rate is quite high for people who do not use medications to help them treat their opioid use disorder. So I like to draw the analogy to insulin for diabetes, and that sometimes helps families understand. You know, we don't pressure people with diabetes to come off of their insulin. Um, and so we don't need to pressure people who have the condition of opioid use disorder to come off of their methadone or buprenorphine. What if I administer too much naloxone or it isn't an overdose? With the nasal spray, you don't necessarily need to worry about administering too much naloxone, but you can make someone's withdrawal worse if you're giving them dose after dose repeatedly or using a high dose formulation. So it's best to set that timer on the phone, only administer at that two to three minute interval, um, and, and to try to provide other support to the person as opposed to multiple unnecessary doses of naloxone. If it's not an overdose, it won't hurt them, but it won't help them either. So it is important to still pivot. You know, Maybe they're having a heart attack or maybe they're having a reaction to diabetes medicines. You wanna look for medical alert tags and other cues. You don't wanna necessarily assume everything is an overdose. Will the person I give naloxone to be combative with me when, um, when they wake up? So this has been widely exaggerated and is a myth. Um, people are often uncomfortable. They may swear, they may uh, have vomiting, they may feel bad, um, but reports of combativeness have been widely exaggerated and it's just not something we see uh, with the lay public using intranasal naloxone. 
will um, fentanyl test strip or naloxone distribution enable heroin use? And that seems kind of intuitive, but the data actually shows us in the other direction uh, that giving out naloxone and in communities that have robust naloxone distribution programs, we see a reduction in ER visits uh, for overdose, and we don't see a compensatory increase in heroin use. Can I travel with naloxone? Absolutely, yes. You can go through TSA. I do it on a regular basis with my naloxone. No one bats an eye at it. Is fentanyl something I will inhale or absorb when trying to help someone? So this is another myth that has been widely promulgated and is very difficult to dispel, particularly among police and first responders. Um, but fentanyl powder is not absorbed through the skin. So so it has to be done through mucous membranes or injected or uh, fentanyl patches, which are specially formulated to cross over uh, the subcutaneous tissue. So getting dry fentanyl powder near you is not going to result in an overdose situation. It may be that people have panic attacks. I would panic if I got a powder on me that I thought was going to be fatal. Um, or it may be sometimes people covering up their own uh, personal substance use, and it's difficult to tease those factors out. But it is important that people are not scared to help someone who's experiencing an overdose due to this myth. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I hope you found this program valuable, um, and it was a pleasure being with you today.